Hey guys, it's Sarah here. In this video, I'm going to be going over the med surge section of the NCLEX RN. So this is going to be quite long. You could pause it, write down where you're up to, come back to the next day, um, because it includes everything that you have to know about med surge from the NCLEX. So before I get started, I just want to let you know that all of this is available in a PDF form that you can follow along. You can write notes, highlight, whatever you want to do um, while I'm talking over here. So you could go to my website, www.sarahrn.com, or just check out the link below. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to start off with fluids and electrolyte disorders. So over here, um, I made a chart. I compare and contrast DI versus SIADH. So DI is diabetes insipidus, and SIADH is symptom of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So what's happening is, is that in DR, there's too little of antidiuretic hormone, and in SIADH, there's too much of that. So you have to know what the ADH hormone does in order to know how that affects the body. So basically, um, the antidiuretic hormone, which is ADH, it promotes water reabsorption in the kidneys. So if you're going to have too little of it, it's not going to promote the water to re be reabsorbed, and it's just going to be peed out. If you have too much of it, it's just going to retain a lot. So the way I like to remember this is DI, so it's basically dehydration. It starts with a D, D and D, because you're peeing all the water out. The SIADH, I think of overhydration over here because it's just so many letters, over, SIADH. So DI, just think DD, dehydration, peeing stuff out. SIADH, you're retaining, so you're overhydrating. So the symptoms are going to be the same symptoms as you're losing water, dehydration, and retaining water. The treatment for that, um, how I like to remember it is, it also has to do with D. So for diabetes insipidus, the treatment is desmopression, which is a D. And then for SIADH, since they're retaining fluid, you don't want them to have more fluid, and give them hypertonic solution, which will help get out the fluid. Okay, so next we go on to other fluids and electrolyte disorder. So dehydration, we all know what dehydration means. Um, one of the main signs of dehydration is when you have poor skin turgor. So you're going to pinch the skin and then let it go, and you're going to see if it goes down quickly. Um, another sign is dry mucous membranes. So you can open their mouth and see if it's dry in there, tachycardic, um, cause they're comp because they're compensating, hypotension, weak lethargic, etc. The treatment for dehydration is rehydration. So you're going to give them back the water. Um, obviously, you want to give them oral first if they need. If they're really dehydrated, you could do IV, but you're going to start with oral. And maintain the fluids at an electrolyte imbalance because a lot of times they lose electrolytes and that could cause low sodium, low potassium, etc. Okay, on the other extreme is water intoxication. So when you have too much, water in the body and just remember water and salt. So if you have too much water, then the salt is going to be diluted. So if you have too much water, you have hyponatremia, too little salt. So that's going to cause symptoms like irritability, lethargy, se seizures could even happen. Um, and that's what you want to watch out for. The next thing is third spacing. So third spacing is basically when the fluid goes from the blood into a place where it cannot be used. So it leads to less fluid that's circulating around the body, but they have a lot of fluid, it just can't be used. So they're still going to be hypotensive, tachycardic, the same symptoms. And this could happen after like abdominal surgery and stuff like that. I just realized I skipped, I skipped the diarrhea, so I'm just going to go back to this over here. So diarrhea, um, don't really give them any medications for it. It usually lasts less than 48 hours. If it lasts more than 48 hours and it has a fever or blood, then you want them to go to the ER or the doctor. Causes are usually from dietary intolerance, malabsorption, medication, laxative overuse, um, and stuff like that. Treatment, you want them to eat bulk forming foods, so rice, bread, stuff like that, and rest, fluids, and if you need to, a little paranoid, which is the medication used for diarrhea. As always, if you see over here, I wrote watch for electrolyte imbalance because the main thing you want to watch out for when you're talking about fluid and electrolyte disorders are electrolyte imbalances.
Um, okay, so for the fluids and electrolyte disorder, I'm going to go over really quickly. I have a really good video on that in like seven minutes. I explain everything and give you mnemonics to help understand that. And I also have a really good cheat sheet that's one page that helps you visualize everything. So I'm really just going to read off the slides and go really fast on this. So sodium, too little, is hyponatremia, and you're going to have symptoms of dehydration. Hypernatremia, too much sodium, you're going to have symptoms of fluid overload. Then we go on to potassium, you want to think of it as a muscle. Hypokalemia, too little, the muscle is not working, so you're going to have symptoms like that. You're also going to have little T waves, so hypo little. And hyperkalemia, you're going to have high T waves, and the muscle is working too much. Calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, calcium, magnesium go together, phosphorus has an inverse relationship, and these are the symptoms, they're opposites of each other. So question. During an assessment of a newly admitted patient, the nurse notes that the client's heart rate is 110 beats per minute. His blood pressure shows orthostatic changes when he stands up, and his tongue has a sticky, paste-like coating. The patient's spouse tells the nurse that he seems a little confused and unsteady on his feet. So based on this assessment, which condition do you think the patient has? So the answer is going to be A. Because when someone is dehydrated, the heart rate's going to increase, so they're going to be tachycardic. But the blood pressure is going to reflect orthostatic changes because of the reduced volume. And when they stand, they could get very dizzy. Um, they could also get altered mental status. And like I said, the mucous membranes are going to be dry and covered with like thick, pasty coating if you ever saw someone who's like really dehydrated. Um, okay, so now we go on to glucose. So we're going to go on to hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia is when the blood sugar is too low. Causes of that is someone not eating because of the sugar in our food. Causes of that are too much medication, too much insulin, and alcohol. Symptoms they're going to have is hunger, confusion, headache, sweating, slurred speech, and irritability. Treatment, what are you going to give them? You're going to give them glucose. So if they're alert and awake, you're going to give them oral glucose. So let's just say oranges. Oranges has a lot of sugar in them. You give them, you drink that, they can feel better. If they're unconscious from it, then you give them gl glucagon IM. It's an intramuscular injection. And then obviously, you always want to recheck their blood sugar. Um, then we go into hyperglycemia, too much sugar. So too much sugar is caused by too much food, too much ins um, too little insulin, too little exercising, basically, you know, like diabetic. Um, symptoms are going to have our same symptoms as diabetes, excessive thirst, excessive urination, hunger, confusion, headache, fatigue, and blurred vision. What you want to do for them for treatment is going to be insulin to lower the blood sugar, medications. Um, like metformin, you want them to control their diet and exercise. Okay, burns. So with burns, we're worried about the ABCs, the airway, breathing, circulation. We're worried about their pain. We're worried about the risk for infection because it's open. And removing the escar. With burns, what you should know is that there's a huge fluid shift. So they're hypovolemic is the number one thing you should be concerned besides for the airway breathing. Hypovolemic shock is the most common complication of burns. How we replace that is that we give lactated ringer to them. And the way you know that they're being replenished correctly is by the urine output. So someone with burns is quite critical that you monitor the urine output and you see that they're having a normal urine output. So that means that enough fluid is in them to come out. Also, because it's a big surface area that's exposed, they lose a lot of heat. So you want to keep that in mind. And like I said over here, the key is the fluids. So question, what's the best indicator that the fluid resuscitation has been corrected? And their answer is the urine output. It should be at least 30 milliliters per hour. And remember that number. Um, okay, so we just talked about that fluids are key for burns. Now, how do you know how much to give? You don't want to overload them. You don't want to underload them. 
and that's why you're going to use these formulas. This I would just commit to memory. You're going to have to know this for the NCLEX, and there's really no other way to know it but memorize it. The Parkland formula is a formula used to figure out how much fluid to give. The formula is as follows, like over here. It says 4 milliliters per kilogram per total body surface area. Whatever the number is, let's just say you get 1,000 for the number. You're going to divide it by half. Half of it is going to be given over the first 8 hours, and the other half is going to be given over the remaining 16 hours. The only thing is that you want to watch out for is the question, because the question could ask you what's given over the first 8 hours or what's the total amount given. So you want to keep in mind the question and answer accordingly. Now how do you know, so we know 4, we know how much they weigh, which is the kilograms, or the pounds divided by 2.2. And how do we know the total body surface area? That's where we use the rule of nines. The rule of nines is as follows. If you look over here at this person, it's showing you the percent per area that they burn. So say, for example, someone burned their head. If they burn just one side of the head, it's four and a half, the other one four and a half. So if they burn the whole head, it's nine. The same thing goes for, you know, the legs. Each leg is nine. So if they burn the whole left leg, then so 9 plus 9, that's 18. The whole right leg, 9 plus 9, that's 18. If they burn both of theirs, and you want to you want to add them. So in the question that they're going to give you, they're going to give you an example, and they're going to tell you how much the patient weighs, and they're also going to tell you um, what the patient burned. So the patient burn the hands, the right hand, the right leg. They're going to tell you what the patient learnt, burned. You're going to... You're going to add that all together, and you're going to plug it into this equation right here. And then whatever that number is, divided by half, the first half is given over 8 hours, the last is given over 16 hours. It's a little confusing, but that's how it works. Okay, question. A 36-year-old patient comes in with a burn covering the anterior side of her right arm and the anterior side of her chest. What percentage of the body is injured? So over here, if you notice, it's asking you just what percentage of the body is injured. It's not asking you to calculate the Parkland formula, because it's not asking you how much fluid they're getting. The answer is 13.5. If you refer back to that picture, you'll see the anterior side of his arm is 4.5, and the anterior side of his chest is 9%. So that gives you 13.5. Now, if they ask you how much fluid the patient needs, you take that number, you times it by 4, times it by the amount of kilograms they are, and that's your number. The first half of that number is over 8 hours. The last half is over 16 hours. Okay, so now we go on to cardiac, the cardiac system. So the DASH diet is a commonly used diet used to control hypertension, you know, low salt. Anyone with cardiac problems, you want a low salt diet, low fat diet low saturation, etc. Then we go on to a stress test. What a stress test is, is that it uses medications or a treadmill or something to produce vasodilation of the coronary arteries in someone who you suspect coronary heart disease. They give them a dye or something, you're not supposed to eat or drink before the test, no caffeine, no nothing, and then they basically want to measure um, to evaluate the blood flow to the heart. A Holter monitor is something that measure and record the heart rate and rhythm over a period of time. It's continuous and it keeps recording it for around 24 to 48 hours. The patient, you want them to keep a diary of their activities and their symptoms so you could correlate it to the findings. And next we go into femoral palpiteal bypass surgery. So what that is, is basically it's circumventing a blockage in the femoral artery with like um, a stent to open it up and restore the blood flow. So you always want to make sure to do a neurovascular assessment. Heart failure. When we talk about heart failure, just think of the heart as a pump. So if you have a hose, right, and you put your hand in front of the hose, or even just like a finger or two in front of the hose, then less will come out and more will be backed up in the hose. So the same thing like the heart. The heart is a pump that is supposed to pump out blood, 
and when it's not functioning as it should, so the heart fails, um, it can't squeeze as much, whatever the cause is, not enough is going to come out, and a lot's going to get backed up. So that's exactly what happens in heart failure. You have the right and the left heart failure. The, the right side heart failure is when the blood is backed up, and you're going to have symptoms like that. So if you have a lot of fluid or blood in you, think of signs like edema, weight gain, um, an extra heartbeat that you're hearing the fluid. And the left side heart failure is when the blood is backed up to the lung. So think of all your pulmonary respiratory um, symptoms. The, the treatment for heart failure is like, number one, you want to get rid of the fluid. So you're going to have a diuretic. They should not take NSAIDs because it could cause sodium re retention, which you don't want them to retain even more fluid. You should have them not eating salt in their diet because that, like I just said, retains fluid. And um, you want to weigh them daily because if they have more than three pounds in a day, then that means that they're retaining and, that's, and you want to treat that. Um, then we go on to hypertensive crisis. Hypertensive crisis is systolic blood pressure more than 180 and a diastolic blood pressure more than 120 with evidence of organ damage. So organ damage like kidney damage, eye, heart failure, hemorrhagic stroke. Basically, for this, I would just really know the symptom. Just know what the symptoms are that, and then you, and then you want to think hypertensive crisis. So number one, a headache. If someone comes in with a headache with a blood pressure of over 180, over 120, then you want to think hypertensive crisis. And what you want to know in hypertensive crisis, so you have to lower the blood pressure, but you don't want to just bam it down because that could cause a lot of side effects. So you want to slowly decrease it. Um, and that's it pretty much you have to know for that. Okay, next we go on to aortic dissection. So what that is, is that it's a tear in the inner line of the aorta. So the blood comes out, weakens the aorta wall, and it causes less perfusion to your vital organs, basically. Causes from that, the main cause is hypertens hypertensive could really cause that. So the symptoms you should know that they're going to have is acute onset of really sharp, ripping chest pain, they call it, and it radiates to the back. They also have difference in blood pressures between the two arms, and this is an emergency. They need to go for surgery right away. Um, the next one we have is aortic stenosis. So stenosis is basically narrowing, so it's narrowing of the aortic valve. What you want to know over here is that you're going to have a loud systolic ejection murmur. That's going to be like the key word that the NCOX will say, and you want to think aortic stenosis. Um, it's usually asymptomatic, so that's really the only symptom that you should know. Okay, next we go on to pacemaker. So a pacemaker is basically a small device, like you see in the picture over here, um, that is placed in the chest to control the abnormal heart rhythm, which is usually for like someone who's really bradycardic. What you wanna do as a nurse is that you wanna report signs of fever, redness, swelling, or drainage at the site, because that can mean infection and needs to come out. You should know that the patient's gonna have like a metal alert bracelet that's going to let you know that you have a pacemaker and um, no MRI for them. You want to hold phones like, oh, like the airport um, security, you know, tell the airport they have a pacemaker, etc. Um, what you should know is the microwave ovens are safe for them and um, you want to assess for the capture of the heart rate. Next we go on to ICD. So ICD is implantable cardiovert defibrillator. So this is a small device that senses and defibs only life-threatening dysrhythmias. So the difference between a pacemaker and an ICD is that the pacemaker is to control abnormal heart rates like bradycardic, and the ICD will only fire if there's a deadly arrhythmia. So um, it's a little bigger. It prevents a person from dying, like I just said, from like V-fib. That's a deadly arrhythmia, and that's pretty much what you have to know for that. Um, okay, so then we go on to defibrillate. You should know when you use a defibrillator. The only rhythm that you're going to be using a defibrillator is for V-fib and pulseless VTAC. So they like trick you and say, what if they're asystole? There's no rhythm, so you can't shock them back. If they're asystole, you don't 
It's only CPR, only. The only time that you're going to have a defibrillator is for V-fib and pulseless VTAC. That's what you should know. You want to begin with 200 joules, and of course, the patient has to be unconscious. I hope you know that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so basically, I'll tell, I'll tell you really quick how it's going to work. You place the pads. You see the pads over here? You literally just follow the instructions, exactly how the pad says, exactly where it goes. It's You want to charge it. It's going to say, all clear. You want everyone to move away. No one should be touching the patient. And press the button. It's going to give a shock. You're going to begin CPR right away as soon as it's finished. And um, it's really only used for emergencies. Okay, and then cardioversion. So cardioversion is... It only delivers a shock on the R wave. So that's the QRS complex, you know. It's only going to deliver the shock on the R wave. And it's used for supraventricular tachycardia and AFib. And that's pretty much you have to know for that. Okay, now we go on to CABBAGE. So CABBAGE stands for Coronary Artery Bypass Grafting. This is a surgery. It's done to restore blood flow to the heart due to blockage in the coronary artery. It's basically they take blood vessels from an area in their body and then it bypasses the damaged artery and then the person has restored blood flow. When they get discharged, you want to tell them the regular cardiac discharge, no smoking, lose weight, health exercises, etc. Post-op, they could do very light housework for two weeks, but they really should not be lifting any more than um, like five pounds. Okay, ACS. So ACS is acute coronary syndrome, and basically that's a broad term that encompasses a lot of cardiac conditions that causes decreased blood flow to the coronary arteries. Next, we go on to angina and myocardial ischemia or infarction, a heart attack. Basically, what you have to know is that angina is chest pain. Stable means that the person gets it and then it stops when they rest. So as soon as they sit down, they don't have chest pain anymore. Unstable angina is that as soon as, even if they're sitting down, they are still going to feel a chest pain. Both of these types, stable and unstable, both could be reversed. So as soon as you restore the blood flow, then the heart is continuing as it should. Myocardial infarction or ischemia is unreversible. So whatever damage has happened, there's no blood getting through, and whatever damage has happened is irreversible. So your goal is to stop the progression so that no more heart cells die. Your goal in myocardial infarction, you know, you're going to have to give them IV, 12 lead EKG, blood work, Medicaid with nitro, etc. But your real goal here is to get them to the cath lab. You want to get them to the cath lab as soon as they could to that you could restore the blood flow. Okay, a question. The nurse enters the room of a patient diagnosed with congestive heart failure. The patient is lying in bed and they're gasping for breath, cool, clammy, and has vocal cyanosis. Which intervention would the nurse implement first? Would you sponge the client's forehead, obtain a pulse ox, take the patient's vitals, or have them go into a sitting position? I'm going to give you some time to figure that out. So number four, you want to put them in sitting position to decrease the workload of the heart. After that, you take the vitals, check the pulse ox, and then do the forehead. Always remember your ABCs. Okay, so then we go on to rheumatic fever. So this is an acute inflammation of the heart that occurs two to three weeks after shrub infection. So in the in the NCLEX question, they'll like mention that the patient had a shrub infection and now is having um, this, and then you want to think of rheumatic fever. Um, it affects the heart, the skin joints, the CNS. The treatment for this is basically to get rid of the strep infection and anti-inflammatories. Okay, next we're going to pericarditis. So pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium, which is the membrane sac that goes around the heart. Um, this could lead to fluid in the pericardium, so when there's more fluid, then the heart can contract as well, and it can lead to life-threatening stuff like cardiac tamponade. So you want to treat this, you know, pretty quick. When you assess the patient, you're going to hear 
it's very distinct pericardial friction rub so that's like key you want to know about this um and it causes pain that is worse when they breathe cough etc so you want to pa place the patient in Fowler's position um with something like to lean on and give them NSAIDs it's an anti-inflammatory and that will decrease inflammation okay next we go on to endocarditis so endocarditis is an infection itis means infection so infection of the endothelial layer, which is the inner layer of the heart and the heart valves. So there's basically, there's like a vegetation around the valves that could break off and could travel to other organs, which could cause, it's like a clot, you know, it could cause a stroke. So you wanna watch out for this also. They have very specific symptoms that I would know if they ask these, then you wanna think of endocarditis. The symptoms that are specific um, are splinter hemorrhage, as you see over here, in this top picture. The second one, you also see Janway lesions and clubbing of the fingers. You want to give them antibiotics and watch out for signs of like embolism or clot. Um, okay, so next we go on to cardiac catheterization. Like we said before, this is done to diagnose coronary artery disease. What they do is that they put um, a catheter through a vein or artery. It's usually the femoral, but wherever they want to go through. And it threads to the heart. Then they put a dye through that, and they could see the obstruction. If the obstruction is more than a certain percent, I think it's like 70%, then they put a stent through that to open up so that the blood could go through. You want to know for post-op, you want to watch out for bleeding. That's the main thing. You want them to remain flat post-op, assess the hemodynamics, and bleeding is the main one like at the incision site you also want to report any back or flank pain tachycardic or hypertension because that could mean that there's bleeding in the retro perineal okay so next we go on to respiratory system so respiratory patterns i would just know this basically euphoria is normal normal is 12 to 20 breaths per minute Apnea means absent of breath, bradypnea, so brady, just take the word, you know, and break it apart. So brady is slow, but it's still normal. Causes of that could be drug, sleeping, something that like hypnotizes a patient. The opposite is very fast, so tachypnea, causes of that could be fever, anxiety, exercise, you know, when you exercise and you, you know, and then Cosmal respirations are not normal. They're rapid, deep, and labored. Causes, the main one they like to ask is DKA, metabolic acidosis, and renal failure. And the next one is chain stokes. So that's rapid and deep, but all of a sudden it has a period of apnea, and then it goes back into rapid and deep. And causes for this are stroke, head injury, and drug overdose. So these are abnormal. Um, okay, then we go on to the respiratory system when we're palpating. So you're gonna hear you're gonna hear crepitus, which is like a grating, crackling sound, and that means that there's air in the chest. Tactile phrenitis, you put both the palms on the patient's back and ask them to say 99, 99. And then you wanna feel that they're both equal on both sides. Then we go on to percussion. So these are all different um, sounds that you're going to hear. You know, if you hear a dull, it indicates solid area, hyperresonance, hyperinflated lungs, etc. Okay, so here are normal sounds that you're supposed to hear. So tracheal is harsh, discontinuous. It's heard midline over the trachea. Bronchial is loud, high pitch, and it's heard over the trachea. Then we go on to bronchovesicular, which is heard over the scapula on either side of the sternum, so over here. And vesicular is soft, low pitch, and it's heard over the rest of the lungs. Abnormal sounds that you're not supposed to hear, crackles, which is also called rails. They're crackling sounds, basically. They could be fine or coarse, and it usually indicates that the alveolar collapsed or filled with a lot of fluid, so they're making that crackling sound. 
Strider is a high-pitched sound. It indicates upper airway obstruction. Wheezing is like a musical sound and indicates lower airway obstruction. And plural friction rub, it's like a grating sound. Um, okay, so next we go on to incentive spirometer. Incentive spirometer, basically you wanna know um, what to teach the patient how to do. So it's a device used for post-op patients to prevent the lungs from collapsing, usually with like a rib fracture or something like that. So you wanna tell them to do five to 10 breaths um, every hour while they're awake and tell them to sit up, hold it, seal the, the mouth on this piece over here and inhale for two seconds and then exhale. Okay, next we go on to oxygen. So oxygen, you want to watch out for fire, cigarette smoking, that could cause a fire with oxygen. Also, also Vaseline you want to watch out for with oxygen because it could, it's able to go in flames. Um, you know, just precaution, keep away from grease by fireplace, nail polish remover is also flammable. Um, just know what's flammable and stay away from that pretty much. But I've never seen them asked about that. Okay, COPD. COPD is chronic obstruction pulmonary disease. So this includes two conditions as you see over here, one and two, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Um, it's basically, these two are obstructive pulmonary diseases. They're usually caused by smoking almost always. You want them to have vaccinated. They're risk for infection. They get very tired and they usually have polycythemia. What you want to know about them is you, you don't want to hyper oxygenate them, like give them too much oxygen because it could decrease their drive to breathe. So chronic bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. They're known as the blue bloaters because they're usually cyanotic and they have cough and excessive mu mucus production. Emphysema is damage to alveolar sac, so it's like air trapping. And they're known as the pink puffers because they're not cyanotic. And they usually look like they're hyperventilating um, and they have like a barrel chest. Okay, aspiration pneumonia. So aspiration pneumonia is when aspirated stuff like food or something you aspirate in it and it causes an inflammatory response and then bacteria grows. So risk factors are someone who's demented, um, difficulty swallowing. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure this doesn't happen. So elevate the head of the bed, help them swallow, like go like that, you know, et cetera. Okay, acute respiratory failure. So this is when there's damage to the alveoli causing the alveoli to collapse. And then when that happens, the fluid leaks in. The lungs cannot oxygenate, oxygenate then, and then the carbon dioxide builds up in the body and the oxygen can't get in. So they're gonna, so this is acute respiratory failure. So they're gonna have mental status changes, refractory hypoxemia, acid base imbalances, um, hypoxia, dyspnea, like all those symptoms. Okay, what you want to know is that a lung contusion is basically a bruised lung. Um, it's basically when you have blunt chest trauma. So let's say you were driving and you hit the steering wheel like right on your chest and it's a bruise basically. So it's life threatening because bleeding into the lung could cause acute respiratory distress like we just said before. So you want to monitor them, make sure this doesn't happen, and give them oxygen, medications, ventilator if they need it, etc. Then we go on to pleurisy, so that's inflammation of the lining of the heart. Symptoms are going to have chest pain, especially when they breathe or cough, and a pleural friction rub. Okay. When developing a discharge plan to manage the care of a patient with COPD, the nurse anticipates that the patient will do which of the following. So it says COPD patient, will they develop infections e easily, maintain their current status, require less oxygen, show permanent improvement.
So like we said before, they're at risk for infections. Um, okay, so next we go on to a pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is when there is an abnormal amount of fluid around the lung. You're going to have a chest x-ray or a CAT scan that's going to show you that. And the treatment is going to be um, thoracentesis. That you should know. It's going to be a needle put in to remove the excess fluid. Um, complications after that is a pneumothorax and bleeding. Okay, next we go on to pulmonary edema. So pulmonary edema is fluid in the lungs. So um, pulmonary effusion is too much fluid around the lungs. Pulmonary edema is too much fluid in the lungs, like in the alveoli. So it causes the lungs to swell. Symptoms, like all these symptoms for respiratory are basically the same. You know, shortness of breath, um, tachypnea, edema, edema etc. Treatment for pulmonary edema is going to be diuretics because you want to get out the fluid and oxygen. Okay, next we go on to hemothorax and pneumothorax. So hemothorax is when blood gets into the pleural space and causes the, the lungs to collapse. A pneumothorax, by contrast, is when ear gets into the pleural space and causes the lungs to collapse. So basically, in a hemothorax and a pneumothorax, the lung is collapsing because some, there's too much something. So hemo is blood, pneumo is ear. So they're both, either one is in the pleural space and it causes the lungs to collapse. Symptoms, like I said before, they're going to be in respiratory distress, ear hungry, like, like they're panting for ear, um, all the respiratory symptoms. What you want to watch out for is a tension pneumothorax. So a tension pneumothorax is when the ear that came in cannot escape so then it just builds up priority for that is that you want to apply a sterile occlusive dressing taped on three sides you want to leave one open because you need it to come out and then after that then they're going to place a chest tube in to get the ear out but your immediate priority is to do the dressing with three sides they like to ask on that Um, okay, so next we go on to asthma. So we all probably know a lot about asthma, but basically it's when the airways are inflamed and narrow due to something that triggered them, you know. It could be an allergen, it could be exercise, cold air, whatever is the trigger. So the symptoms are going to be wheezing, that's the main one. Um, if the wheezing stops, that's actually really bad because that's a silent chest, so that means that there's no airflow. They're going to be restless short of breath, using their muscles, accessory muscles, etc. What you want to do is set them upright, oxygen, you want to give them a bronchodilator and steroids. It's pretty easy for the respiratory system because they're all pretty much the same symptoms. You're always going to give them oxygen um, and something to dilate or take away the fluid. That's pretty much everything. But um, either way, so for asthma, you want to give them corticosteroids and bronchodilators. So status asthmaticus is basically an exacerbation of asthma. And um, the patient has a risk for respiratory failure. We want to do is put them in high thalamus position, prepare for intubation if you need to, oxygen and epinephrine to open the airway. A peak flow meter, as, as you see in this picture over here, is um, it basically measures the airflow out of the lung. It's the best indicator of moving ear in an asthmatic patient, so it's used quite often. Okay, the question is, what's the main difference between a pleural effusion and a pulmonary edema? Okay, so like I said before, a pleural effusion is pleural, a fluid around the lung, while pulmonary edema is fluid in the lung. Pleural effusions also come with chest pain, while pulmonary edema do not. Okay, next we go on to the GI system. So what you should know, number one, is that when you're doing an abdominal examination, you always want to auscultate before you touch them, like palpate or percuss, because you don't want to palpate percuss, and then it's going to move around stuff, and it's going to um, make your auscultation off. 
So bowel sounds, normal bowel sounds that you should be hearing are high pitched and gurgling. But you should know that it's absent after surgery for 24 hours. And the reason why I say you should know this is because the NCLEX will give you a question and they'll say you have, which one should you um, tell the doctor about X, Y, and Z. And one of the questions will be absent bowel sounds after surgery for 24 hours. You'll think, oh, that's the one. But it's not because it's normal to have no bowel sounds after surgery for 24 hours in circumstances. Um, one more thing I want to say is bor, bor, gami, however you pronounce that sounds, are basically large gurgling sounds that suggest peristalsis, which means increased movement. Um, causes could be like diarrhea, a viral illness that's causing the diarrhea, etc. Okay, bowel obstruction. So it's basically a a blockage in the intestines, like the name says. So small versus large bowel obstruction, they like to ask. Small bowel obstruction, the symptoms are more acute. Large bowel obstruction, the symptoms are more gradual. Small bowel obstruction is usually nausea and vomiting, and large bowel is usually constipation. Both obstructions could cause abdominal pain, and both could lead to dehydration. Treatment for this is going to be an NG tube. You want them to have nothing by mouth, NG tube, fluids, and pain medication. Next, we go on to the Valsalva maneuver. It's basically you hold your breath and like you beer down, kind of like you're going, like if someone's going to the bathroom, you know, and that actually causes the vagus nerve to slow down the heart rate. It's Contraindicated in people with a stroke, head injury, ICP, glaucoma, something where you don't want the pressure to build up in you. Okay, so next we go on to the hernias. Hiatal hernia is when a part of the stomach pushes through the diaphragm. Inguinal hernia is the protrusion of the abdominal context through the inguinal canal, which is like it Basically the same thing, just in different locations. So inguinal is going to be by the groin area. And here just shows different type of hernias, umbilical, incision, femoral, etc. You want to teach a patient to not do stuff that are going to make it worse or come out. Like lifting weights, um, something, coughing, something that can increase the pressure in the abdomen. Treatment is going to be minimal invasive surgery. A lot of times they're not treated also. Um, okay, next we go on to small bowel follow through. So this is basically something to examine the anatomy and, and function of the small intestines and it uses x-ray weights. What you should know is that it's normal to have chalky stool till 72 hours post up. So then again, don't click that answer as something that's abnormal when it's normal for somebody who just had a small bowel follow through. Okay, next we go on to a barium enema. It's also an x-ray done to visualize the colon to see like polyps, tumors, diverticula, etc. Patient education is that you want them to take a laxative to, to empty the stool and do a clear liquid diet the night before. Um, okay, so what's an ostomy? An ostomy is basically a surgical opening on the surface of the stomach that allows the stool to leave the body. So instead of the stool leaving the rectum, it leaves through that opening um, in the body. Usually this is done for cancer or severe cases of Crohn's disease or GI disorders. There are two different types. There's an ileostomy and a colostomy. An ileostomy is basically to open, it's an opening in the abdominal wall through which the small intestines are brought out of the body, and a colostomy is the large intestines are brought out of the body. And when I say an opening, I just think of a stoma over here. That's the opening. So when, if you have an ileostomy, think of the small intestines. So the stool is going to be less form. It's going to be like liquidy. Colostomy is already in the colon, so the stool is going to be more form. And as you get much closer to the rectum, it's going to be more formed. 
um, the stoma. So you see in this picture, there's a stoma. So for the stoma, you should know that it should be between pink and red. That's normal. It should be moist and shiny like this picture. And if there's anything else, then you want to report that. You want to have patient education. So first of all, you want to tell them that they should empty the bag when it's a third full to prevent leaks. You should tell them no um, sustained release or terror coating medications for this patient. Right after, so post-op right after the surgery, they should have a low fiber diet. And then when the ileostomy heals itself, then they'll have a regular high fiber diet. They should avoid foods that are not completely digested, like popcorn, um, stringy vegetables like celery, seeds like strawberry, etc. And they should avoid gas and odor foods like broccoli, cauliflower. Okay. Okay, so next we go on to colonoscopy. This is a procedure where they take a scope and they basically look inside the rectum and the colon. You, the only thing you really have to know for this is the patient education. You want to let them know that they have to have a clear liquid diet the day before and nothing in their mouth 8 to 12 hours before that. The day before the exam, you're going to give them like a bowel cleansing thing, like an enema or um, usually they just do um, polyethyl glycol. They have to drink the whole thing and then they kind of, just keep going until they're completely clean for the next day. The next one is a bronchoscopy. Just know for that that, that it's an endoscope. It's used to visualize the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi. Um, after post-op, you would just want to monitor for respiratory distress because that's where it went. The next one is peg tube. Just know that that's an invasive procedure under conscious sedation that places a tube for feeding. Um, okay, so which of the following factors would most likely contribute to the development of a client's hiatal hernia? Number one, having a sedentary desk job, being five feet, three inches tall, weighing, weighing 190, using laxative frequently, and being 40 years old. Two, so any factor that's going to increase intra-abdominal pressure, like obesity, could contribute to the development of a hernia. Okay, so now we go on to gastric lavage. That's basically done through a tube to remove toxin, any toxins, and to irrigate the stomach, like, for instance, by an overdose. It's not really done now, so I highly doubt they'll ask it, but just in case they do ask it, just know that. It's done for that. Next, we go into an enema. An enema is like a little tube thing that's in, that's put into the rectum, and you squirt it, and it puts in the water in there. So it makes it, you know, when someone's constipated, it's a very hard stool, and it kind of it either makes it more liquidy or it breaks it up, and it's easier to pass for them to go to the bathroom. That's basically what we have to know for that. Then we go on to lactose intolerance. So what lactose intolerance means is that the patient gets GI symptoms after eating milk products like um, gassy, bloating, cramping, etc. It's usually caused by missing enzymes of lactose. Treatment is going to be not eating lactose food. Or they could replace the enzyme to decrease the sim symptoms and give them supplemental vitamin D and calcium. You should know that some foods, even though people think that they can't eat, but they really could be eaten. Like symptoms um, like foods that are aged cheese or live culture yogurt have very little lactose in them, so they really could eat them. Okay, so Billy Roth 1. It's basically when they remove the distal part of the stomach and create a connection between the stomach and the, the duna. It's usually done in if someone has like a stomach cancer. What you should know is that post-op, you want them to have NPO until bowel sounds return. You want them to have small frequent meals to prevent dumping syndrome. That's the main one. To prevent the dumping syndrome, small frequent meals. What dumping syndrome is, that it's when the gastric context empties way too quickly into the small intestines 
and they have symptoms like hypotension, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, tachycardia, etc. If a dumping syndrome does occur, what you want to do is you want to have no fluid between meals, lie down after meals to slow the gastric emptying. So you would think that it's to sit up, but no, for, for dumping syndrome, it's lie down after meals. Um, okay, now we talk about bariatric surgery. So you just want to know for this is that post-op, the dumping syndrome you want to watch out for. You want to watch out for dehydration, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And you want to watch out that you don't give them too much. So what I mean by that is that they usually have a reduced amount that their stomach can handle. So you don't want to be giving them like a whole meal after. Slowly work them up. So a little bit, then a full liquid diet, and then solid, etc. Work them up slowly. Abdominal plasty, I just put out the word so you should know what it is. It's a tummy tuck. And refeeding syndrome. So refeeding syndrome is when someone is in a period of starvation and then all of a sudden you just give them like food. So their body goes into like a fluid and electrolyte um, shifts and it could cause real lethal, like even cardiac dysrhythmias. So what you want to do is you want to feed them slowly and not just, you know, here piece of chocolate and sugar after you didn't eat for a long while. Okay, GERD. So what well, GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is also acid reflux, basically. We all know acid reflux is that when they eat too slowly, um, too fast, it could come back up and cause that heartburn. Interventions, you want them to lose weight, eat very slowly, eat smaller frequent meals instead of like huge large ones. Um, you give them medications like a proton pump inhibitor. You want them to avoid stuff like caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, high fr fatty fried food, etc. And they should not lay down immediately after eating. The next one we go on to is peritonitis. So peritonitis is itis, so it's an inflammation of the membrane lining the abdominal cavity. Symptoms are going to be fever, abdominal rigidity, guarding, rebound tenderness, and abdominal distension. You want to treat it according to the cause, so it's usually like antibiotics or surgery. Okay, next we go on to abdominal aortic aneurysm dissection. So this is when there's a weakened portion in the aorta, so it's like bulging now because it's weak, that runs through the abdomen, as you see over here. So causes for this are increased pressure, obesity, smoking, hypertension, and they're going to have back and abdominal pain. They could also have like signs of shock. What you want to do is you want to treat it according to the size. So you're either going to monitor them that it doesn't grow bigger or surgery. And of course, lifestyle changes. Endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair is EVAR. It's basically a treatment for abdominal aortic aneurysm. Okay, so next we go on to peptic ulcers. What well, peptic ulcer is that it's an open sore that develops in the inner lining of the stomach and the upper portion of the small intestines. As you see over here, it's an open sore. The problem is that the stomach is very acid and so that could really burn and really hurt. Risk factors are H. pylori infection, chronic NSAIDs in use, stress, diet, lifestyle changes, etc. First, we want to tell the patients that NSAIDs are very damaging and they could cause peptic ulcer disease, so you want to stop them if they're on that. Tell them don't smoke, no alcohol, don't eat through the day because every time you eat, more acid secreted and it's just going to um, make it worse. Treatment is going to be for H. pylori treatment, which is like antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors. The next one is paralytic ileus, which is an obstruction of the intestines due to the paralyzed, so it's not really moving, of the intestines muscles. Symptoms are going to have abdominal discomfort distension, all abdominal symptoms, nausea, vomiting. What you want to do is you want to have them nothing by mouth, NG tube, and 
like medication to help them not vomit. Okay, next we go on to irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, which is basically chronic bowel discomfort, I would say. Um, it's, called by, it's caused by an altered intestinal mobility. There is no inflammation. That's the main difference. The main difference between IBS and IBD is that over here, it's irritable bowel syndrome. It doesn't say inflammatory, so there's no inflammation. Symptoms you're going to see with that is mainly diarrhea and constipation. So they're going to have either one or the other one or both. Treatment is you want to reduce the, the, the diarrhea and constipation, um, manage them with diet, exercise, stress management. Okay, next we go on to IBD, so inflammatory bowel disease. So this, as the name says, it's an inflammatory condition. So it's basically an umbrella term for conditions that causes inflammation of the bladder. It includes stuff like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Symptoms are going to be chronic inflammation, bloody stool, anemia, elevated um, like ESR, which are inflammatory blood markers and stuff like that. Crohn's disease. So let's divide the, them two under the inflammatory bowel disease. So ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis is chronic inflammation. Like I said, it's an inflammatory disease and also ulcers of the long intestine. Symptoms are going to have abdominal pain, cramping, frequent bouts of bloody severe diarrhea, weight loss, and anemia. You want to treat them with anti-inflammatories, anti-diarrheals, lifestyle changes, like small frequent meals, etc. The next one is Crohn's disease, and that's when it's an inflammation of the GI tract. It could occur anywhere in the GI tract. So ulcerative colitis, inflammation in the long intestine specifically, Crohn's disease, inflammation anywhere in the GI tract. Symptoms are going to be pretty much the same thing, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, weight loss, malnutrition, etc. Treatments are going to be anti-inflammatory, same thing, antidiarrheals, lifestyle changes. Yeah. Okay, next we go on to diverticulitis, which is basically when... There's like a sac-like protrusion that occurs in the long intestines. When they become inflamed or infected, then the diverticular becomes diverticulosis. Symptoms they could have is fever, lower left quadrant pain, diarrhea, etc. Treatment for that is going to be, if they have an acute diverticulitis, then you want to have them on a low residual diet, so no fiber foods. But after their symptoms resolve and it's not acute, you want to have them in a high fiber diet to prevent this from happening. You don't want them to do anything that increases the abdominal pressure, like lifting, um, coughing. Yeah. Um, I just did this slide. I guess I did it twice, but I'm still. Okay, question. So after instructing a patient with diverticulosis about appropriate self-care activities, which of the following patients' comments indicate effective teaching? Select all that apply. So this is really supposed to be on the next line. But number one, with careful attention to my diet, my diverticulitis could be cured. Two, using a cathartic laxative weekly is okay to control bowel movement. Three, I should follow a diet that's high in fiber. Four, it's important for me to drink at least 2,000 ml of fluid. Five, I should exercise regularly. So this is a select all that applies, so it could be more than one. So the answer is going to be three, four, and five. Whoever has diverticulosis, you want to tell them to maintain a high fiber diet, unless it's acute, but in general, high fiber diet. They should increase their fluids to help them go to the bathroom, and have activities to help things going. You should know that it could be controlled, but it can ne never be cured. And you want to tell them to avoid using regular laxatives. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. That's the end of part one 
of the MedCert section. Stay tuned for part two. And also, if you want any of this in a PDF form, check out my website, www.sarahrn.com, or look in the description box below. And also, if you want any, um, if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can look at the description box below and I post daily or every other day and collect style questions for you to review. So please subscribe, like this video, and stay tuned for the next one. Bye.